And he's got tons and tons of headroom there. This is the master that he turned in. Are you here for the rising? Are you here for the rising? Jump. Hey, I'm Max, and today we're doing Mastering Mythbusters. So we're going to talk about five common myths about the mixing and mastering processes, specifically mastering, and we're going to clear them up for you. Um, these are things that I've heard a lot of people say over the years, and hopefully I can provide some examples to show you exactly what I think, and hopefully you can learn something no matter what level of uh, engineer you might be. So the first one that we're going to talk about is the myth that louder or softer is necessarily better. Um, like most myths, there is a kernel of truth to this. Our brains interpret sound based on signals sent by the vibrations of tiny hairs inside our ears that are called cilia. Uh, and the louder a sound is, the more it excites our cilia, which means that the sound is more exciting to our brains. So you would think that that means that louder is always better, right? Well, maybe not because if you've ever met a mastering engineer, you know that we love to ramble on about something called dynamic, dynamic range. range. So that's the difference between the highest peak and the lowest valley in the waveform. Um, a master that is dynamic will have a large amount of range between the lowest and highest, and a master in, that is not very dynamic will not have a lot of range. A good master should be dynamic, and it should also be loud and exciting, which could be at odds, um, but in practice mastering is about hitting the right balance between all of those, and it's dependent on a bunch of different factors, foremost among them being genre, in my humble opinion. Uh, in different genres, different loudness levels are appropriate. Uh, so for example, we're going to take a look at three different songs that are in different genres uh, and compare how they're mastered in terms of loudness. So the three songs I've chosen for this are um, the intro theme from Variations on a Melancholy Theme, which is Brad Meldaw and the Orthe Orpheus Chamber Orchestra's new record. Uh, I chose a song called Damn It by Tor off his new album Eel. And um, I chose Fractions by Nicki Minaj as well. So this is a classical piece, a pop piece, and a rap piece. Um, and I'm going to pull up Yulene Loudness Meter, which is one of my favorite loudness meters. Um, so that we can see what the program loudness of each track is. So first of all, let's listen to the Brad Meldaw, which is extremely dynamic. So we have a soft piano section. And the other instruments begin to come in. So for this piece, it's not incredibly loud. We have a uh, loudness rating uh, of about minus 22 luffs, um, and that's appropriate for classical music because it's dynamics, right? If it's marked piano or mezzo piano or something, then it should not be super loud. And as a mastering engineer, if I were to smash the limiter and bring it way, way up and make it a lot louder, as loud as the songs that we're about to listen to, it would be inappropriate because you would lose the emotion and the artist's intent in having played it soft in the first place. Now, with all that said, let's take a listen to the pop record. And I'm going to um, start it kind of at the verse here. You can hear that and see that uh, it's extremely loud. Uh, we're at minus 4.5 luffs, which is a really high loudness rating. That makes it exciting and attention grabbing as a pop tune. Uh, but however, you could also see that there was some dynamic range. There was some space for uh, 
the song to get louder when the chorus part came in. So compared to the chorus, the verse is a little bit softer. That makes a lot of sense, and it's something that you'll find uh, commonly on a lot of pop records now. Uh, so finally, let's take a listen to the Nicki Minaj track and see what that's like. No action, I'm about to get them that traction, send a distraction, then I'm align them like fraction. Fuck a break, I let them live, look at all them eating, but these bitches gon' be mad once I call this meeting, cause they gotta move around once the- Okay, so in this genre, we see that it's pretty much conversant with the pop record that we listen to. The Love's numbers are pretty close, and it sounds uh, pretty much the same in terms of loudness, although in the chorus, the tour song is loud. Um, which again makes sense. Uh, in this genre, in rap, um, you really want to emphasize the sub bass and you want to make sure that the uh, vocal is as intelligible as possible. So the way that they mastered this makes a whole lot of sense. And frankly, if they had used mastering techniques that were better for the other genres, um, it wouldn't have sounded as good. So louder is not necessarily better and softer is not necessarily better. Uh, there are a few other things to think about here as well that um, many mastering engineers might not necessarily talk about. Uh, for one, a master that has too much dynamic range might not necessarily translate perfectly to consumer audio playback systems. Um, for example, let's say I'm listening to a song on my AirPods on the sub subway going into work. Um, and if the master is incredibly dynamic, uh, I might not be able to hear everything that's going on in the song over uh, either the ambient noise or there might be frequency masking issues to contend with. Um, and additionally, you know, with too much dynamic range, uh, just in the master, there might be frequency masking that occurs. Um, in order to avoid that, you compress and bring up all the elements. Uh, and that's why you limit in the first place to make things loud enough. Otherwise you could just leave it super soft and nothing would matter. Uh, but that's not what you actually do. So as a mastering engineer, it's your job to be conversant in the genre that you're working with and make sure that the mastery that you deliver is appropriate for that genre. Another common use case is, is the track going to be played in clubs? Uh, an incredibly dynamic master just might not hit the same on club systems or uh, it might not fit in a DJ set. So you, may, you might be forcing your DJ to who is playing the song to be constantly adjusting the gain knob in order to fit your track in with the others. Um, I know this is something that I experienced a lot when I started trying to play my uh, masters in clubs. I realized that they just weren't loud enough to compete with the rest of the stuff that was happening. Of course, you can adjust the gain knob and of course, you know, dynamic range is still important, but it's just another thing to think about when you're uh, producing masters. Also, loudness normalization by streaming platforms is another thing that we have to talk about. When you listen on a streaming platform, uh, it will automatically adjust based on the program loudness, uh, whatever you're listening to, so that it's at a similar loudness level to everything else that you're listening to. Um, this is usually uh, a peak calculation. So that means that if you have a master with a high dynamic range that you turn in, um, it's going to sound better than a master that is crushed where the peaks are all pretty much the same. Uh, those peaks will be reduced, whereas the master with the higher dynamic range will be brought up. That's how streaming platforms are attempting to combat the loudness war, essentially. It's a whole lot of stuff to think about, and uh, that's why mastering is something that people pay for. Um, the bottom line is that there's no perfect loudness number. There's no amount of luffs that you should have that's gonna make your song sound right. It all depends on what the track is, what you wanna do with the track, what genre the track is in, um, and a ton of other different things. And a big part of the mastering engineer's job is to understand all of that and deliver a master that is appropriate for the artist's intent. Uh, the next one that we're gonna talk about uh, this is a great myth. Uh, it's the myth that XYZ plugin or piece of gear will make my tracks slap. So it really, uh, there really is no magic bullet for this. There's no plugin that is going to make masters sound beautiful or perfect. Um, every engineer has plugins that they like and maybe pieces of gear that they like. Uh, but in the end, it's nothing more than just a bunch of tools. Um, Actually, you might be surprised by how few pieces of gear are typically employed by a lot of mastering engineers. Of course, if you have a nice studio, you might have uh, everything that you want and a solid mastering house will have solid gear. Um, 
But even though everyone does it differently, uh, most mastering techniques don't really involve all that much different types of processing. Uh, dynamics and EQ alone can take you really, really far. Uh, of course, you might want a super nice EQ or a super nice dynamics processor. This is uh, really understandable. It doesn't mean that engineers don't have favorite plugins. It doesn't mean that some plugins aren't better than others uh, or that certain pieces of software or hardware aren't commonly found in mastering studios. They are. But the thing to remember is this, it's not the gear, it's how you use it. So all the plugins and all the analog gear in the world are useless if you don't know what you're doing with them. Um, just for a quick demo, I'm gonna pull up a song that I mastered. Um, this is a song by my friend and uh, Brooklyn DJ Aisha. Um, and I will show you my plugin chain just to show you uh, what it is that I did on this. Here's the original song. I'll just loop uh, a louder part of it so that you can hear. So this was without any mastering processing applied. And now I'll start uh, turning these on one by one. Okay, so we have a little bit of EQ. It, actually, it's doing nothing. I just had it on there uh, in case I wanted to use it. Uh, so we'll turn that back off. A little bit of multiband. Um, this is yeah, doing a little bit of dynamics processing in a frequency banded way. So controlling some of the bass, controlling some of the mid range. I have an instance of ozone, which is providing some EQ, some dynamic EQ and some maximization. I have a clipper plugin, K-Clip. I love this one. So that's gonna be a soft clipper. And then finally a limiter. And I use Pro L a lot. Anyway, so that's an example of how with a few plugins, you can, as long as you know what you're doing with them, uh, they can take you pretty far. Um, does that mean that these plugins are perfect? Absolutely not. Does that mean that these are the only ones that you can use? Certainly not. It's just whatever you like and whatever you know what you can deliver with them. Um, so that's a little example of my in the box master chain, just to show you that you can use a whole lot of different plugins, uh, but that there's no magic bullet. Myth three is the idea that we will fix it in the master. So if there's a problem with a mix, um, don't try to fix it in the master, please just fix it in the mix. It's going to be a lot easier. It's going to make you more happy with the mastering engineers final delivery. Um, and it's actually gonna be a lot more effective as well and more efficient. So if there are issues with a mix, like for example, if the hi-hats are too loud or something like that, fix that in the mix and then send it to be mastered. A mastering engineer's job is to bring out whatever you have there. Uh, it's not to mix it right. Um, with that said, if you are uh, unhappy with your mix, or like maybe if you think the mastering engineer would like a little bit more control, or if there's a few things that you wanna change, you could alternatively try something like a stem master. So a stem master is when the artist provides the engineer with a stemmed out mix uh, so that the engineer can make more precise mix adjustments. Um, and I have an example of this to show you. This was a song um, by Tamaguchi that I did a stem mix or a stem master on. Um, so I took, yeah, let's see, three, four stems, no, five, because these are two different tracks, um, and applied processing, applied some mix stuff, and basically did a really small mix. So Tama did mix a lot of this, and then I did a little bit of mixing and a little bit of mastering processing. Like I have my vocal group, I have my beat group, and then I have a master chain on all of this. Um, so just to give you a quick example, I'll turn my mastering processing off and play what this sounds like. Because he provided the stems, I was able to balance in terms of volume um, exactly how I wanted it to be so that the mastering could be the most effective instead of trying to make mix changes and then send it back to be bounced in the master and going back and forth, really inefficient and kind of a waste of everyone's time. Um, but this turned out really well, I think. Uh, here is with the mastering applied. Okay, 
Love that. Myth four is a really fun one. And that is that AI is the answer. Uh, AI is the only is only the answer when it comes to basketball, uh, go Sixers. Um, in the audio world, though, it's not that simple. As AI mastering services proliferate and gain popularity, the entire business of mastering has begun to evolve. And some have speculated that uh, artificial intelligence will replace mastering engineers completely um, as they keep getting better and better, while some others think that an algorithm is never going to be able to do as good a job as an actual engineer in terms of making music sound pleasing to humans. In my opinion, the truth is somewhere in the middle. Uh, AI tools I don't think will ever completely replace mastering engineers, uh, but they do have some uses that traditional engineers simply can't provide. Uh, so for one big example, AI mastering is cheap. Um, according to Lander, which is one of the first AI mastering services, uh, if you sign up for one of their plans, you can get your songs mastered for a few dollars per master. Um, engineers, meanwhile, have to keep the lights on in their studios. Uh, they have to pay their employees, they have to purchase and maintain gear, um, they have to feed their own families, and they simply can't work for a couple of dollars per master. If you don't have the slightest clue how to master your music and you don't know any engineer friends who will do it for you for free, probably AI mastering can be a really good option for you. But it's not just person versus machine though. I think that what savvy producers and engineers are doing today is that they don't just rail against technological advances, uh, they use them to their own advantage. So mastering engineers don't necessarily need to work against AI, instead they can use it to work faster. Uh, one great example of this is the master assistant um, that is found in Isotope's Ozone mastering suite. Um, the mastering assistant, you can use it to listen to your track, um, make uh, adjustments and provide a suggestion based on the artificial intelligence algorithms in the software. You can accept or reject those suggestions or adjust them however you see fit. That makes mastering quicker and easier and really helps with things like, for example, programmatically detecting frequencies where you might want to make dynamic EQ changes. Um, so my humble opinion is that the answer to the question, uh, AI or engineer is both. Uh, it's a yes and kind of situation. So just for a little demo here, I have uh, Ozone pulled up and I have, I have three versions of the same song. So this is a uh, pre-master. This is my master that I did with my plugins and processing and stuff. And then this is um, Lander doing the same as I did. Uh, uh, it's their just default algorithm and we'll compare all three and see what we get out. So first of all, I'll demo this Ozone here. I'm gonna loop uh, the loudest part of the song and pull up Ozone. Okay, and now I can set it playing and press the master assistant and it will uh, generate a suggestion for me how I should master the track. Okay, so based on listening to my track, the, that's what the Ozone algorithm suggested in terms of processing. It said, uh, okay, here's how you should change the EQ. Here's how you should process the dynamics. Looks like it controlled my bass a bit. Here's some dynamic EQ issues that I found. And then it uses the maximizer to bring it up to the target loudness. Um, so I could use this and I could start with all of this stuff and reject it as I want or not. Um, when I was mastering this with my own plugin chain, I did use Ozone, um, although I didn't necessarily use exactly this. Uh, this is really helpful in terms of making a first starting point when I'm doing my masters. Um, so let's compare it to how it came out to my own master and to Lander. Here's the Ozone. Pulling out, we never tripping, wilding out like your mom's coach. You at a party, you ain't getting on. Rep where you from, make you 
wanna blow the trumpet and I take your number one from the back to the front. Pulling out, we ain't never tripping, wildin' out like your mom's calling you at a party, you ain't getting on. What you talking? I'm grown now. How? Cause I got the cushion for the pushing and the bill. She thrills all the feels, good meals. Come on, look into my eyes. It's okay if you don't understand. Say I'm here for the fun and you know I'm here for the grand prize. Anytime I come in, yeah, I'm going with a sight, with a sight. Do it, do it while we don't have lies. Okay, so it sounds to me, and I'm not sure how it sounds with uh, YouTube compression and all this, but to me, it sounds like the ozone suggestion is a little bit less cramped, a little bit less like squashed, a little bit more dynamic. Um, but I do want the song to be exciting, so I decided to make it more clipped and more limited. Um, I think that mine sounds better than the Lander one, to be honest, but I am obviously biased. Uh, so the point is that uh, you can use AI to your advantage instead of um, just saying, oh, you know, uh, my masters are better than that and I would never pay for that or whatever. Uh, you can also use it as a reference or like just an example of how a mastering engineer might do it. The final myth that I want to talk about is that mastering engineers need 6 dB or need 10 dB of headroom. This simply is not true. Um, and you can apply mastering techniques no matter how much headroom exists in the pre-master file. Uh, so we can look at this. I mean, there's some headroom here. You can see that the peaks aren't touching the absolute top there. The only reason why mastering engineers request headroom is because they want to make absolutely sure that the mix isn't clipped. If a professional mixing engineer worked on the track, this is not a problem, and so they probably aren't going to even bother asking for that. Uh, but if the artist or producer is doing all the mixing work themselves, they might not necessarily understand all the nuances of how to export the file, um, what plugins to leave on and off. Uh, they might limit, you know, or a soft clip or something like that. Um, and so in these cases, mastering engineers might think that it's easier just to ask for a certain amount of headroom. Uh, and for whatever reason, it usually turns out to be they ask for a 6 dB or a 10 dB. I don't really know. Um, but the rule of thumb to follow, I think, is this. Make sure that your mix doesn't peak above 0 dB, so you want to make sure it's not clipped. Uh, you don't want to see the red things coming out here. Uh, they didn't. Uh, someone once told me they didn't start using red lights on the mixer because they ran out of green ones. Um, yeah, obviously they started using red lights because going into the red is bad when you're talking about mastering. Um, leaving a little bit of headroom also in the pre-master file, as my collaborator that sent me a song to master did here, is perfectly reasonable and perfectly acceptable. But if you're removing compression or processing from your master and it's killing the vibe of the song, that's not really desirable either. So if I'm a mastering engineer and I have a trade-off between getting a slightly more compressed mix and getting a boring mix that the artist isn't happy but that has enough headroom for me, I definitely would choose the uh, one that sounds better because it's going to make my job easier. Uh, it means I have less to do. Um, also, simply turning down the master fader to comply with a request like 6 dB of headroom is not a good idea. Uh, it's going to provide more headroom, but it's not going to do anything in terms of changing the dynamics of your mix. So uh, don't bother doing that. What you should do is, if you have a limiter on, bypass it. Um, so turn it off before you export your pre-master mix. Um, and here I just have a, key, a few uh, examples of what I'm talking about. So this is a totally reasonable pre-master. That gives plenty enough headroom. Let me pull up the loudness meter so that we can see what we're talking about. Here. Calling, we don't deal with rookies. I'm too gully. I'm too thorough for the uh uh. You brought nothing. I can tell you ain't from the side. This is a file that I would not want to turn into a mastering engineer because it's already limited. So that means that if we continue with the mastering process, the mastering engineer is not going to have all of that much room to work with. Um, I've already, as you can see, kind of clipped the peaks off here. Maybe you can't see actually because it's pretty small. 
uh, but since the clips are peaked off here, or peaks are clipped off here, I would turn off the limiter before exporting this. Same with this track, uh, heavily limited. You see there's not much dynamic range to work with. This could be okay if it's preserving the vibe of the song, um, but it's not necessary. So if I was sending this off to get mastered, I would turn off the limiter. And finally, I just wanna provide one example of a pre-master. I had the same artist, um, DJ Shifty, uh, mastered, mixed and mastered this song for me. So, um, the pre-master track I just wanted to play you and the master just to see uh, what the difference actually was. So here was the pre-master that he turned in. And he's got tons and tons of headroom there. Uh, this is the master that he turned in. Are you here for the rising? Are you here for the rising? Jump up on me. Jump up on me. Jump up on me. Jump up on me. Okay, so uh, a super nice amount of headroom um, meant that he was able to turn this particular pre-master into this master, which I think sounds great. Um, without having clipped it or anything. A little different because he was doing the mixing and the mastering, but you get the point. Uh, so great. So hopefully this uh, clears up some of these commonly uh, used mastering myths. Uh, if you have other questions about these or if you have other myths that you'd like us to address, uh, let us know in the comments. And hope you enjoyed it and happy mastering. Are you here for the ride?